Okay, let's get going. Last session of the day, the uh, table is gone and we have these um, council. We're slightly worried we're going to slide off the stage here, so there's nothing actually there. So please do excuse us if there's a sudden accident in the, uh, in the middle. Um, my name's Danny Gittings. Um, I was a journalist in Hong Kong for 15 years. I now, um, I now teach and write about Hong Kong constitutional law. Um, the most, most important thing I'll say before we, before we get started, this is a Q&A session, right? We've heard a lot of very good um, talks today, but now there's much more chance for you to ask your own questions, okay? I will briefly introduce Jill Phillips here, and she has a little bit to say, but then please, the more questions, the better. Um, there, are, there will be microphones roaming around the room. Uh, please just do put up your hand, and um, as soon as the microphone comes, ask a question, okay? Uh, the second thing I'll say is, well, I, I should declare an interest. I mean, I. I've been reading the Guardian newspaper, I don't know, since Wallace. I grew up, like so many people in Britain, reading the Guardian newspaper. I still read it online every day. Um, my father, for a number of years, worked as a journalist for the Guardian. Um, for those who are not so familiar with the Guardian newspaper's reputation in Britain, I think I can't do better than cite um, Chris Patton, the last British governor of Hong Kong, who was not an ideological soulmate of the Guardian. <laughs> Put it mildly, once described it as incurably liberally, liberal bias in The Guardian, which I think is a description they would probably be quite proud of, I would guess. Um, so, uh, The Guardian has always been a crusading newspaper. I well remember that reading when I grew up, when I was growing up. But in, in recent years, it's gone even further, right? And we've seen quite, it's no exaggeration to say, some of the best investigative journalism in the world has been coming out of The Guardian. It was, the, it was the Guardian that single-handedly broke this phone hacking story, right? It's changed, as we've been discussing today, the face of British uh, press regulation in Britain forever. And it is worth recalling that, I mean, when the Guardian broke that story, it was in the face of disinterest and even actually active opposition, downright hostility from much of the rest of the British media and indeed the establishment, the British police for a long time. Since then, I mean, it seems like for almost every big, big media story involves The Guardian. Whether it was Julian Assange and WikiLeaks, most recently, right, Edward Snowden, the NSA revelations, many of them conducted interviews with Guardian journalists um, while he's in Hong Kong. Right? All of which, I guess, makes the job of Director of Editorial Legal Services probably the, well, you, Jill, Jill Phillips has described it as her dream job. Um, not, not many of us are lucky enough to have our, <laughs> have our dream jobs. Um, so I suppose you should count it. Like, um, she, orig she originally wanted to be a historian, right? But um, discovered she couldn't, and so decided to become a lawyer instead. Um, went into what I think we can call the rat race of corporate law, and then escaped um, out of private practice. Um, initially to the British Broadcasting Corporation, uh, she then uh, went on to work for a number, as an in-house lawyer, for a number of other um, newspapers, including The Sun and The News of the World. The News of the World, of course, uh, <laughs> later to close down uh, uh, after she had left and as a result of <laughs> allegations, <laughs> in, uh, allegations of phone hacking, which were also after she left, um, uh, but of course as a result of the revelations of her present employer. Um, She's been very critical of the recommendations of the uh, Leveson inquiry. She's, I think she said um, the worst, worst of both worlds, disastrous, and particularly worried about the precedent that it could set in, 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 in other parts of the world in terms of copying from the uh, British example of um, press regulation. And of course, with all of this going on with The Guardian, she is extremely busy, so we are very fortunate. She literally flew into Hong Kong this morning to join us at the conference. Um, we are very fortunate that Jill Phillips can take the time to join us in the conference. Uh, please uh, begin by uh, giving a warm welcome to Jill Phillips. Thank you. It's always good to get a round of applause in before you start speaking, I find. Um, and as Danny said, I did fly in this morning. Uh, if I start sounding incoherent, it's because I'm sort of falling asleep in various different bits of me. Um, I'm just going to say a few words to try and do a little tiny bit of scene setting. Um, but to be honest, there are so many things that you've, we've already talked about today that, that really sort of come up day to day almost in, in what I do. Um, so what I wanted to say was that um, everything I've heard sort of uh, exemplifies for me the complexities of operating a, um, a global modern news organization in uh, 
a modern media law environment uh, and illustrates particularly, I think, how hard the job of an in-house lawyer uh, for a media organization has become. Um, increasingly, I feel that I'm the Jill of all trades and the mistress of none. Um, you know, my job has always been and still is about risk assessment. That is essentially what I do. I, I assess risk. But when I started uh, doing media law, although it wasn't called media law really when I started doing it, I, I don't know when uh, Jeff Robertson and Andy Nichol first published their book on media law, but um, there, there really wasn't a, a sort of term of art that we use in the way that we do now. But you know, when I did it, the, the, the dimension and the context was, was really very one-dimensional. It was print only. The paper was published at a particular time of day, each day. It was only UK law that we were concerned with. Um, it was our own journalists, most of whom were employees. Um, and within that, it was pretty much stock in trade, that it was a civil law job only. I, I came into it with a civil litigation background. Uh, and essentially, the sort of tools of the trade were libel, contempt, copyright, breach of confidence, a bit of trespass, maybe a bit of Official Secrets Act. Uh, and we also had the Press Complaints Commission in the background uh, as, as a regulator dealing with ethical matters. Now, today, we're dealing with such a completely different environment. You know, we publish to the world. Uh, in addition to the print edition of The Guardian, The Guardian's got three separate websites. It's got its UK website, the main one that most people will be familiar with, but we've also got a, U a US one and an Australian one, all of which are publishing stories from journalists in those countries. So effectively, what we've got is a 24-hour you know, global output organization. Now, uh, Charles may be familiar with that from, from sort of Bloomberg, who had far more experience of this. But it's a completely different world from the one newspaper a day uh, that it was in the 1980s. And you know, not only is it 24-hour, not only is it global, but potentially it's not just UK law that we're worried about anymore. You know, I, I can't possibly know the laws of all the places where The Guardian can be downloaded and where, in theory, we can be sued. But, you know, in recent years, either The Guardian or other papers I've worked for have been sued in Greece, Italy, France, Zimbabwe. We've had threats in Australia and Pakistan. So, you know, we have to deal with a whole new legal regime. Uh, and we have to ask ourselves, practically speaking, how we're going to do that. Um, we have an enormous amount of content on our site that isn't our content. We have liability for it, but it's not ours. It's not our journalists, it's members of the public, it's freelancers, we have bloggers who self-publish, um, we have all the uh, user-generated comment, below the line material that we've talked about and touched on already. Uh, and you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, how do you, how does one of the Guardian's moderators decide whether a comment that's put under a US blog that they're worried about in UK law, what do they do about it? Do they apply Section 230? Do they apply the UK defamation law? Do they apply Australian law to it? Um, you know, we're, we're increasingly have to, having to grapple with these problems. And, and as is the way, these things need to be dealt with quickly and promptly. So, uh, you know, th those things alone are, are make, it, make it a completely different environment. In addition to that, um, you know, the civil causes of action that we deal with has expanded. Privacy wasn't a word, I promise you, that I mentioned in 1987. I, I don't think it came across my door. If we had actions uh, that would now be breach of privacy actions, they were done on the law of, under the law of confidence. And, uh, so we've got privacy, we've got harassment, we've got data protection. I mean, you only have to think back to the Gordon Kay case, when they couldn't come up with a cause of action for him, to think if you were to run that case now, how many potential causes of action he would have. I mean, he'd have, he'd have five or six things that he could go for, plus a whole gamut under the PCC code. Um, so, uh, and what privacy's done is it's on one level uh, opened up a prior restraint route that wasn't there before. So we've had 
you know, we had the sort of high spring of the uh, tra Trafigura and the super injunctions. That's all settled down a bit now. Um, and we may not have criminal libel in the UK, but we have a whole host of criminal statutes that can catch out journalists. You know, we've got RIPA, we've got the Official Secrets Act, 1911, Section 1 still in, in force, 1989, the Computer Misuse Act, Malicious Communications Act, Bribery Act, Terrorism Act. Uh, th there's any number of criminal statutes. So, and, and of course, the, the, the consequences of breaching criminal statutes are that much more risky for journalists, and we've touched on that uh, again uh, in the first session this morning about whether you can send journalists to jail. But all these offenses uh, have, have uh, imprisonment, apart from the Data Protection Act, at the moment. Um, and that's possibly coming down the line. So what we have got as a balance is we've got the DPP's guidance on prosecuting the media. We have, we've seen how that uh, has been used in two or three cases, the Amelia Hill case, David Lee, and the Sky TV journalist. So we've got a little bit of guidance on how the prosecutors and the CPS are going to be using that. Um, but you know, we've also got the, uh, the David Miranda incident, where David Miranda is detained at Heathrow using terrorism legislation. And coming back to, to Danny's point, um, you know, I worry about that. We're a democracy. We're an elected democratic place, but we, we have legislation that allows you to do this. If we can do this, what can other states do who don't have any of the protections that we think we have? Um, and that's something maybe we can discuss. I mean, in addition to, to, to all those things, just a few other things to throw into the mix in terms of what I have to try to sort of cover uh, day to day and, and keep an eye on. Um, Article 6 issues on open justice. The media are constantly challenging bad court orders that are wrongly made, that restrict reporting of cases, that prevent people from being named when they should be named. Uh, and we're constantly having to keep an eye on that. And we basically do that with our own money. We have to pay for it. We never get our costs back, even if we win. Um, and constantly, the courts are shown to not be using their powers right. Now, we try to educate and there's a joint uh, uh, booklet that the, the media and the judges have put out to try to make sure that orders are properly made. But if we don't challenge them, no one else does. So we've got that issue that we're constantly trying to keep an eye on. Um, anonymous speech is something that I think is a really interesting area. It, 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 it's coming up by uh, virtue of the Defamation Act and the protection for internet uh, in there. The whole of the, whole of the internet um, <coughs> section uh, is essentially built around whether you know or don't know who is making a comment and how you deal with that. Um, and you know, I think it's quite interesting because Oscar Wilde said, if you give a man a mask, uh, he'll tell you the truth. And there are some really interesting issues around where the line is on the extent to which anonymous speech is protected. Uh, we deal with contempt. We have current live issues on contempt of court and our archives, and the extent to which we published something maybe years ago, but a case comes up, and the extent to which we're, we're supposed to take things down, that we're, we're, whether we have to police our archives, that's a very live issue at the moment. Uh, we try to respond to all sorts of consultations when we find out about them, and we don't always know about them. But uh, again, Lord Hunt mentioned this, but on the back of Leveson, there are consultations coming up the line on Data Protection Act, which um, has the potential to make it much harder for journalists to use the journalistic exemption, Section 32, in the Data Protection Act uh, it potentially is going to make us much more vulnerable to subject access requests from all sorts of people. It potentially is going into journalists' notebooks and what journalists do with their, you know, the, the, they, they meet someone, they write a number down, they write a name down, they put it in their contacts book. That's data, it's personal data. They will do it because sometime down the line they think they might publish something. 
Um, but all that is potentially going to be vulnerable and open to attack. Uh, another thing that Leveson recommended uh, relates to the Police and Criminal Evidence Act and production orders and confidential sources. Uh, and there's a very real worry. I mean, essentially, what Leveson appears to be suggesting is that you will only be able to protect a source as confidential, almost if you've got a written agreement with them saying, you are a confidential source, this is what I agree. And you know, nobody is going to do that. If you go to your source and say, just please sign this four-page letter that my uh, legal department's drawn up for me. So there's, there's some very real practical um, issues there. And just to sort of bring to a close my little bits and pieces, there was a media law conference in London uh, uh, in September. And uh, one of our South American colleagues stood up at that conference and said um, how worried he was about what was happening both in the US and the UK. Uh, and that once upon a time, the US and the UK were the bastions uh, and the exemplars of the protection of free speech. And as far as he could see, rather than South America and other jurisdictions progressing, uh, what was happening was that we were regressing and that actually he could see not that much difference between our jurisdictions and some of those jurisdictions. And, and that's a very worrying thing to hear, that, 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 that someone sees that as, as, as where things are going. Um, final concluding point is Lord Justice Tolson, in a, in, a, in a case that The Guardian were involved in, which was about getting access to documents that are referred to in court, and I guess, I guess this happens everywhere, but increasingly, court cases, uh, people refer to documents, but they don't read them out. People say, yes, we've all seen that, no need to make any. The journalist asks for a copy of those documents so that they can properly understand what's going on, and they're not allowed to have them. So we fought a case uh, and got a very, very strong ruling from the court uh, that we should be able to get those documents. Um, but in that case, the... Um, Lord Justice Tolson, who gave the leading judgment, said this. He said, fine words don't butter parsnips. And what that means is we can't just talk about these things. We've got to do things. And we've got to be very active in making sure that we protect uh, these free speech rights that we're all here to discuss. Thank you very much. That's a lot of bits and pieces. You call them bits and pieces, right? That's a lot of bits and pieces you have to deal with. And um, is it really a dream job? <laughs> uh, anyway, OK, um, I'll just claim the first question. But then, now, I w I w as I'm on the, at least for the moment, on the stage, um, then I will open it up for discussion. And please do just indicate if you've got, if you've got a question to ask. Um, you, you, this is a conference on media law and policy in the internet age. And you were pointing to um, one of the difficulties you face in the internet age. Um, ensued across different jurisdictions. But I wonder if we can look at, flip it round, look on the upside, because um, that's, um, that's something the Guardian's actually been quite astute at, um, <laughs> taking advantage of different jurisdictions. I mean, in the, in the Snowden case, I think the Guardian was positively advertising that you edit your copy outside Britain to try and avoid, um, avoid British, um, British legal constraints and so on. Um, and I think in the past, you've referred to actually sort of making tactical decisions, maybe that was during the WikiLeaks, about where you publish. So is there, is there an upside as well in terms of how you can, you can use these differences between different jurisdictions to your advantage? Yes, I think that uh, strategically, um, we certainly learned from, from WikiLeaks that uh, where we were worried about prior restraint issues in the UK, we could try to get round some of those problems by having an agreement with other newspapers that they would publish something first. And certainly, that was done. I mean, WikiLeaks was a sort of initially a collective of UK, US, Germany, and Spain, I think. And um, various other countries stepped in and out. And, and that did give us the ability to use particularly the US, where we were very less concerned about prior restraint issues to get some stories out that we might otherwise have worried about in the UK. And, in, and I mean, in fact, tactically, what we did from memory was the first, the first set of stories on the cables were foreign stories, high public interest foreign stories. Uh, and, and what that allowed us to do was to sort of scene set about what the cables were, where they were coming from. We didn't publish any UK stories in the first 
two or three days. But once we got the first two or three days out, we then started doing Reynolds uh, privilege uh, letters and contacts on the UK stories that we wanted to run. So that the sort of scene had been set, people knew what was going on. We didn't need to explain where all this had come from. Um, and so you know, strategically, that worked quite well. Um, so yes, you know, I think yeah, there, there are advantages. You're in a special, the Guardian's in a special position though, because you've got now what, websites in three jurisdictions, and you, more to the point, you've got this um, team of international partners. I mean, what, what sort of advice would you give to a, a smaller media organization which maybe doesn't, ha I mean, necessarily can't take advantage of that in the same way? Look for, look for a partner in the US? Yeah, I think, you know, I think look for collaboration these days. I mean, you know, we're, we're, we're working on a global basis and, uh, and, and individual collaborations. I mean, uh, uh, this is not an advert for the film, but the Fifth Estate film about WikiLeaks, which, uh, you know, some people will disagree with some of it, but it does give you an idea about how collaboration can work uh, uh, across the board. And increasingly, journalism is, you know, it, the, Snowden, the Snowden disclosures are also about collaboration, collaboration by a whole different group of people. So, you know, not only is, you know, is there, is it, are we not just talking about one paper at six o'clock every evening? We're talking about a completely different way of working. Uh, and, you know, that raises issues about who's a journalist. Obviously, the big debate, particularly in the States. And, and that leads on, I mean, I think that's the wrong question, actually. I think it's not who's a journalist, but what is journalism? And probably even You more, asked this before, weren't you? Is Julian Assange a journalist? Yeah, well, you know, he's not a journalist, but he's part of the endeavor that leads to the production of what one would say is Article 10 protected information. Um, and, and what you're really looking at is, 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 the, is the content of the information, and is the content of the information in the public interest? And that applies to whether it's Julian Assange, whether it's an individual blogger, your small blogger, whoever it is, or whether it's someone who works for a commercial news organization. So I think that we have to also, it's the, in the same way that the law has not necessarily kept up to speed, I'm not sure that the term journalist, journalism, is, is also you know, necessarily, it's, it's an old term and we, we imbue it with certain things that, that probably we need to be more flexible about. We need another term, don't we? Yes, uh, uh, can you just wait until the mic, the mic comes down? And please identify yourself. Jill. Charles Glasser from Bloomberg. Um, you may know, uh, just a few hours ago, uh, a Crown Court uh, issued an injunction against the Wall Street Journal and uh, involving the, uh, restricting them rather, from publishing the names of people investigate, being investigated in the LIBOR scandal. Now the journal had published, and this fits into a number of the points obviously that you raised, uh, and the, uh, the journal had published it online then the order came in via email, by the way. I find that sort of interesting. I didn't realize that was acceptable service in the UK. But well, you can serve by Twitter. If uh, apparently so. <laughs> apparently so. Uh, in either event, uh, the, jur the journal did take the story down, uh, seeing how we are talking about media law in the internet age. Uh, it, on one level, it does seem silly of the SFO. It, it's surely got to be bouncing around there. but. In either event, in either event, I'm very curious to hear you run the traps, run through the different possibilities. Had you been presented with the same order, I know that um, a couple weeks ago, uh, your uh, top editor had, had opined about moving websites offshore into places like the States in, in theoretical discussion. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, for, for an organization like The Guardian that at the moment is, is a UK-based organization, uh, then we're always going to obey UK court orders. Uh, and if, you know, one of the, one of the considerations that came uh, around from the Edward Snowden uh, disclosures and the decision to destroy documents <coughs> was the worry that if we got injuncted, that would stop us publishing in America as well. Uh, because you know the American, our American organisation is part of our organisation. It would be very hard for us to, uh, I think, publish there when we've got an order in London. I just don't think that we could do that. So you know that that's a consideration around why Alan decided that he didn't want um, to to run that risk. 
Um, but you know, that I, I also think that there is a, that, that there's another side to this, which is also about, um, I suppose, respect for other people's jurisdictions. You know, if you are downloadable in someone else's jurisdiction, and that jurisdiction issues an order that they have concerns about, then I, I think there is, a, irrespective of whether you're bound by it, I, I think you should show some respect to it. And certainly in the past, the Guardian and other UK organizations, for example, where there have been Australian, uh, Peter Falcone, the uh, backpacker, I seem to remember, there were a number of orders being made by Australian courts. Now, you know, the hard copy of the newspaper, we were very relaxed about. The chances of that going all the way to Australia and being a contempt issue was not a problem. But the website was, because it's accessible, um, it, it's read, and, and so what was happening was that different stories, a different version of the story was being put up on the website to respect the order that the Australian court was making. And I think you know, increasingly the global organizations, the big organizations, will be doing these things. They will be respecting them. But the, but the fact that, I mean, again, taking what happened today, the fact that they published the story and then took it down, are we to simply throw up our hands in frustration well, I mean, the bell has been rung. I guess you know. See what if, I mean? If it was a UK organisation, from 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 memory, I haven't seen the wording of the order, but um, I I did see it come in on my BlackBerry, as is the way. Um, and um, it, it, there's a trial going on, so this is an order to prevent certain names being mentioned because there there is there is either a trial going on or about to start. And, um, well, it's got to be more than in, they wouldn't get an injunction if it was just an investigation. So there's got to be, people have got to be well, charged. Yeah, well, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that, you know, I think if it was a UK newspaper, they probably would not have published whatever the Wall Street Journal published, because we would have been worried about the strict liability rule under Section 4.2 right. of the Contempt of Court Act. So the chances are, I would think, UK <coughs> newspapers wouldn't have published in the first, in the first place. But that, you know, a, a US organization is not necessarily going to be familiar or making, you know, it's the reverse judgment calls. Um, you know, we, are, we can be very relaxed about what we publish in America um, in the same way that we, we're not relaxed about what we publish here. And I mean, I've got a reverse thing going on at the moment where uh, a story was cleared by our US lawyers. It was not put through the UK at all. The person concerned is not suing in America, so the American legal advice was absolutely right, but they are going to sue here because uh, they think they've got enough of a reputation to be able to get to sue. And you know, suing us in London is the proper place to sue us, so we can't take advantage of the new provisions of the Defamation Act. Uh, the, only, the only argument we've got is a reputation, that there's no reputation in the UK. And global figures these days with the internet, you know, that's a downside well, yeah. if you like of the internet because, you know, it, everybody has a reputation that, you know, you can find quite easily. Well, you've talked about this, haven't you, and the issue of o online archives as well, isn't there? I mean, we've had a couple of cases, haven't we, where um, papers are essentially they, I mean, it wasn't the Times win on the printed version but lost on the, on the, uh, on the archive in one case. Uh, well, that's, you're probably talking about flood, yeah. I think. Um, and, and you know that yes, I mean flood's not really an archive case as such. I mean floods and floods interesting because it's a Reynolds case. So you 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 Reynolds your original story, the original story that you write. You've gone to them beforehand. You publish it, and you're satisfied that you you've been responsible. What happens? And that story then goes online in that version. Three months later, four months later, someone comes to you and says, "Hey, something's changed." And in flood's case. What had changed was that there was a police investigation that effectively exonerated the uh, policeman who was involved. And the issue was then, with something that's online and continuing to be online, what do you do about it as a newspaper? The original piece was fine. Uh, and, and the upshot of Flood really is that once you know from a reasonably authoritative source that what you published originally responsibly is wrong, then the responsible thing to do in order to keep the protection of being responsible is to either change it or add something to it that makes clear what has, what has happened. Um, and you know, we, we are constantly having to keep an eye on things, but I mean, fortunately, we, at the moment, we don't have to sort of self-police. We don't have to try and remember whether someone won an appeal that we wrote something about. You have to rely on people coming to you. But, but I mean, our basic policy on those sort of things is 
we don't want to take down because the original story was right um, at the time it was written, and you start reinventing history if you're not very careful about changing things going back. So what, what, what I think most people's preference is is that you add a notice saying, you know, since this was written, X was acquitted on appeal or whatever the position is. And, and, and that's what we think is the proportionate way to deal with these things. But some people would want you to take the whole thing down. You know, some people would want you to say, well, I, I was acquitted on appeal, so therefore please remove all the stuff about the original court case. Um, and at the moment, we're not doing that. So that's, that's the sort of the libel aspect of that. And then the contempt aspect of the, of, of the archives is you know, we have, as does everybody now, all our, all our past material is available on an archive. And um, you know, if uh, and it happened with the Ian Tomlinson uh, policeman, PC Harwood, uh, PC Harwood was, who was the chap who was accused of pushing over uh, Ian Tomlinson during the G20 riots. Um, PC Harwood was eventually charged, um, I, think, I can't remember, with, a, with, with murder or manslaughter or something quite serious. And of course, there was a lot of stuff going back that had been published before he had been arrested or charged. So it was published at a time where there was no contemporaries. But down the line, uh, there was concern that this material could prejudice. Now, that, that, you know, the stance that the media have always taken is that these archives are effectively hidden. They're, they're, they're like they're in boxes. And the only way you can access them is if you go into a search engine with generally not just a name, because if you put, an, if you put the name PC Harwood into Google, you will get thousands and thousands and thousands of stuff. Um, and the risk of contempt in reality is, is minimal because someone's going to have to plow through it. It's got to be the juror plowing through it. So you know, we've always maintained that the archive is not really a publication for contempt purposes. Now, the, there's been a Law Commission report on that. They, disag they disagree, really, um, with that approach. The judiciary disagree with it, at least at first instance, which is as far as we've, we've got. Um, but it's a, it's a very real problem in terms of you know, how you run your archive whenever there's a court case coming up. Because the, the, what you end up doing, in a way, from our perspective, is penalizing the UK press, who try to be responsible, uh, but letting everything else still stay out there. So it's not just you know, getting The Guardian and The Times and The Telegraph to remove some pieces from their archive is really going nowhere near the problem in most instances. So Again, that's a, re that's a very live issue. Um, and, and the trouble is, once you take stuff down, someone's then got to remember to put it back up. And you're reliant on the court possibly telling you when you can put it back up. And we, the courts just, you know, the courts aren't geared up for that. So it's not really fair on the courts to expect them to write, you know, saying, well, now this is done, you can do that. Um, it, it just doesn't happen that way. I mean, I've been trying to unravel an order, a series of orders that were made in a terrorism trial in Manchester. And the, the judge says he's going to make an order. I've got a transcript uh, where he says he's going to make an order. He didn't actually ever make the order. There is no written version of it. So you're reading into what he said he was going to do. There's then another sort of order made somewhere else. It then turns out that a court in a completely different place that had nothing to do with it, but the judge decided he hadn't done quite the right thing. So he makes another order. And trying to unravel all that, you know, it, it, it's beyond the media and lawyers, let alone the courts, to be able to, to keep all that. So and, unless and until there's some better system, I sort of think you're looking at proportionality and, uh, and risk. And for me, the risk of prejudicing a trial in 99.9% in .9 of these cases is, is just so minimal that you should not be going down the, the route of saying to the media, take the, the UK media, take this stuff down. You get more, cha you get more challenges in the internet age, isn't it? Yeah, I want to uh, uh, go back to, you uh, mentioned in your opening remarks, uh, uh, David Miranda, his detention. And uh, looking at it from across the Atlantic, it seemed that the uh, UK government had two goals. One was revenge and the other was spite. Um, and my question for you is, you know, were there other actual more genuine goals uh, uh, afoot? And two, what has, been the, what has been the response in the UK? Other genuine more? More genuine government uh, goals of what you know were, were they truly just saying you did this to us now we're doing this to you, 
Um, again, that's what it seemed, facially speaking, the notion that he was involved in any sort of terrorist activity is obviously laughable on its face. Well, so. I, I, there's a judicial re review hearing. Um, I mean, David Miranda is challenging his detention under Schedule 7. That is currently listed for early November, um, and the government and the Met are going to have to justify their actions, although Having said that, and this comes back to another topic, which is open justice, and um, the, the government have indicated that they're going to apply for public interest immunity on some or all of the material. So there's got to be a hearing about that. Um, and um, I can see this going round and round in circles and, and being a completely unsatisfactory uh, you know, resolution. Um, but, so I, I mean, from my perspective, it felt like spite. But um, you know, the, the, it, it, the, the only they, they must have known enough about him in order to make the decision. I mean, it's one of those circular arguments. But they must have known enough about him to, to make the decision to, to detain him. That they they either had enough to arrest him, and they didn't want to arrest him because if you're arrested, you have rights, and if you're detained under this Schedule Seven, you basically have no rights. Uh, they can do whatever they like. They can rifle through all your stuff. They can ask you whatever questions they like. Um, and I mean, it's thrown up, interestingly, you know, a wider civil liberties issue on the use of Schedule 7 for other people, um, which is a topic that really should have been discussed and what probably didn't get enough media attention and now has for, for, for other people. But um, you know, I, th I think it is, as I said, quite worrying in a democracy. But I also gather from a piece that Lynn Oberlander wrote in The New Yorker that you know, this happens in America as well. You know, the, the sort of the transit area of international airports is, 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 a, is a sort of free zone. Um, and Laura Potras, I know, has been stopped going in and out of America. So, you know, it's not just, a, there are bigger issues here. And there are, there are issues about, you know, David Miranda was not a journalist, but David Miranda was undoubtedly engaged in a journalistic endeavor. And I think you have to look at the ultimate uh, you know, I, people will disagree with what The Guardian's done in terms of the publication of the material, but The, the Guardian believes that it has published material in the public interest and that it has done so as responsibly as it could. Um, and in the same way that uh, it tried to do with Julian Assange and, and WikiLeaks, the, the Guardian thinks that that is a better route of publishing information in some ways, given the enormous volume of information that you know, the fact is that Bradley, both Bradley Manning and Edward Snowden were pretty low-grade operatives. And Edward Snowden had access to um, GCHQ material, UK material, as did apparently over a million other Americans had access to the GCHQ intranet. You know, that, if that's right, then you really have got to start asking questions about all these things. And there does need to be a debate um, and that's what uh, we, we've been calling for in the UK. It's been a much more fervent and, 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 and well-argued debate in the US about all this than there has in the UK. And at the moment, there is now a debate in the UK, but it's not, it's not been very nice um, in terms of uh, the general view that's coming out. Uh, I mean, with the, 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 an MP's called for The Guardian to be you know, criminally prosecuted over this uh, under the Terrorism Act. But right? you also have your defenders, don't you? The Deputy Prime Minister came out and supported you. Well, well, and he said quite rightly, you know, there is a difference between what Edward, you know, the, the, the Guardian had nothing to do with what Edward Snowden did and decided to do in the same way that Julian Assange had very little to do with what uh, Bradley Manning initially decided to do. Uh, you know, you start up a relationship at some point down the line, but, you know, the Guardian's not the one who stole, stole the material. It's stolen by someone. It's given to a journalistic order, organization. No journalistic organization is going to turn down that sort of thing. That's just, you, know, you might not like it, but that's what journalists do. Um, and once they've got it and it's out there, then you know, it's going to be, a, you know, there, there, is a, there is a difference. And, and, and I think you know, journalists have done that since time immemorial um, in different ways, whether it's you know, in the old days, you could go to someone's bins. You know, Benji the bin man, as we know, as Heather knows very well, you know, that's how he made a living for a while. But you know, the trouble with we, the we, internet. We, I think we should explain for. Does that, uh, Benji, does everybody uh, Benji probably does Ben the bin. What's a bin? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so ben, very famous one, big street journalist. Benji is a is 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 a 
I don't know how best to describe him, but a, a very bright man who is not a lawyer, but um, made a living for a while, going round to various people's bins, getting information out of them, and selling them or giving them to various news organizations. I mean, since then, he's transformed into, he sits in nearly every sort of uh, Article 10 case that is in the court's defamation cases and knows all about them. Um, and quite often, he would be able to tell you, you know, X has said this in this court and Y over there and gave us this continuity. So, but you know, as I, I mean, he's just an example. Bins, bins were great because bins would have one person's material in them. The internet now has everybody's material in them, and everybody you know, can go in and ferret around in it, and that's the problem. And that's not, that's not our problem, and that's not our fault. It's just the way the world has developed. And you know, technically, people are going to have to look at their individual privacy and what they do to try to control it. So all these issues sort of interrelate. And at, at the end of the day, you know, as, as an in-house lawyer for a, for a news organization, what you're trying to do is to make sure that, that, that the journalists and the editor understand what the law says. Um, and for example, on the Official Secrets Act, you know, there is a test of damage um, under, uh, under um, Section 6. Section 5 doesn't apply because this isn't Crown Servant doing the leaking. Uh, so it's a Section 6 of the Official Secrets Act, and you're looking at damage. And that's why taking it very slowly, going to the government, um, putting things to them, trying to ascertain whether things are damaging or not, um, is, is what you do. Uh, again, some people don't think that journalists should do that. But I have a feeling that there's a case, there was a case when I was at the Sunday Times, uh, Ian Tomlinson, Big Breach, which was Official Secrets Act. And I had, a th I had thought in that case that the courts accepted that when you've got this test on damage, that it was appropriate for editors to make, you know, editors are the ones who make those judgment calls. If they get it wrong, there are consequences. There are consequences in law, and there may be other really awful consequences. So it's, you know, it's, it's a big burden as well. Over here. Um, yeah, just on this point, it also appears that uh, David Cameron has announced that he would allow a parliamentary select committee to review whether or not the Guardian had damaged damaged national security. I mean, we, is this something that you'll be fighting? And what what are the kind of well, we, we I mean, we couldn't we couldn't fight a, a select committee. You know, that's a that's a parliamentary privilege, and we would uh, no doubt uh, be expected to attend and would attend to defend our position. I mean, that's. That's how it works, um, but you know my understanding is that that's what's been that's what's been suggested certainly. Uh, is there a question over here? Thank you. And um, after hearing many talks today, I have a growing feeling that um, the lessons, the alarms given by the novel of George Orwell's 1984, has become more like, timely and relevant today in our internet era. And for example, you see the ubiquitous surveillance, which allows the authority to um, inspect the individuals. And we have this omnipresent internet explosion, which enables, um, which kind of eliminates individual privacy, whether they're willing or aware of it or not. And even though we can, we assume that our government has no intention of becoming big brother, um, it is still, it's not exaggerating to say that we have the hardware for a totally terror regime. So in your opinion, what are some real life um, re reflections and what do you think can be done to make sure that the, um, the high tax advantages are utilized while ensuring that the totalitarian regime does not materialize in the future? Thank you very much. I mean, those are, those are big questions. I'm not, I, I, but I, I mean, what I will say is that I, I think Anyone who thinks that their government, whatever government, in whatever political hue, uh, is not to some extent surveying and getting information would be very naive. I think that applies as much to the UK as it does to China, to the US, to any European. You know, that's what states do. Um, and, and you know, I, I, as I say, I think you'd be naive to think that they don't do that. So I think you know, on a personal level, people can take precautions. You know, individually, there are, you know, there, there, some people won't, won't use mobile phones anymore. Um, certainly, if we're using confidential sources, we're not going to be using the internet and email to communicate with them. Uh, going back to old-fashioned face-to-face uh, meetings and, you know, drops a la 
um, uh, George Smiley uh, uh, and John Le Carre may well be the answer. Uh, you have to you have to be you know you have to be very careful both personally about what you put up, uh, and you know there are debates going on in Europe about the right to be forgotten. Uh, and there is some sort of, you know, technologically, there may well be developments that allow people to do more to opt out of things. And uh, it, it, I, I've certainly heard someone discussing the possibility that, uh, you know, they, they, they'll be able to introduce some sort of fade factor, automatic fade on technology. So the fact that, you know, for example, you publish your baby's photos when they're born and you put them all over uh, the internet. Um, but you know, after a period of time, technology may well say, well, in three months, those will all disappear, or in five years. And you'll have the choice to be able to put those sort of settings onto material that you publish. Now, you know, we're not there yet, as I understand it. But that, so there, I think you know, it's a bit like drugs in sport, Heather. <laughs> we know a lot about drugs in sport, don't we? Having failed um, in Lance Armstrong. Um, but you know, the, 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 drug, the drug users are always ahead of the game. And the authorities are always trying to catch them up. And, 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 and the internet is like that with the law and with privacy. Um, it's a catch-up game. Um, and there, so there's a, lot, you know, there's a lot that can and can't be done around that, I think. I actually preempted my question, which was about the right to be forgotten in Europe. And I was wondering if you could speak about some of the UK's criticism, because I know the EU is debating this right now in their media law. Sorry, report. some of the. I know the EU is currently debating um, in its media its data privacy reform, um, the right to be forgotten. And I know the UK has been really critical. Or some UK politicians have been really critical of it. So could you talk a little bit about that, and, like the pros and cons? The honest answer to that is no. As I said, I'm a, a sort of Jill of all trades, but. European data protection, um, I really still try to put my head in the sack and pretend that I've never heard of the DPA and um, those sorts of areas. But I mean, you know, there is a discussion. I, my, 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 my recollection is that the right to be forgotten is, is fading a bit um, because practically speaking, it's so hard to do something about. But I mean, I think there is an issue in a privacy case. You know, if someone did something 20 years ago and you want to resurrect it now. We do have a sort of concept of a fade factor in our privacy law. Um, and you really, I think, would have still, uh, if there was an issue on whether you wanted to publish something, you would still have to come up with a public interest um, test to justify something that's, that's old but happens to be sat somewhere. Now, we have a little bit more time because the, the buses to take us away won't be coming until 6 o'clock or so. so. If you're up to it, Jill. Um, are there any, any more questions? Uh, yes, actually, gentleman at the back, you were asking earlier, weren't you? Yeah, uh, I'm uh, Cherry, and I'm visiting the JS, uh, GMSC. Um, as, uh, as a journalism scholar, I'm uh, mainly curious about your relationship with the editors that you work with. Uh, you uh, you uh, said that your job uh, basically entailed risk assessment. Uh, so how are your assessments received? And I'm assuming that there, um, there are important uh, differences in institutional culture, organizational culture, among the various news organizations that you've worked with. Uh, could you share a little bit about these different cultures? And also, uh, you know, are you able to reflect on what is uh, an ideal relationship between an editor and uh, his or her legal team that will enable uh, fearless, yet not uh, reckless journalism? Um, well. I mean, the role of any lawyer, ultimately, is to advise. That's what we do. We advise. We, we, we're not the decision makers in most instances, and I'm not the decision maker. I advise the journalist or the editor, um, what, and I give, them my <coughs> I give them my views on what I think the risks are or aren't, and I give them, uh, if I can, some assistance in how I think they can overcome those risks. Sometimes I don't think the risks can be overcome. <coughs> Ultimately, it is always the editor's decision whether something is published. And he doesn't always take my advice. Um, on the other hand, I've been shouted at and told I'm a lily-livered lawyer and how pathetic. 
uh, and then he has taken my advice. So uh, you have also you know, said, haven't you? This editor is much better than previous editors you worked for. Well, I mean, uh, Alan, Alan's great to work for because he, Alan Rusbridge, Alan Rusbridge who's the editor of the Guardian, is very great. Is very good to work for because he's very well, he's very interested in the legal issues. He's very knowledgeable about them. So you can have a, a, a very uh, good exchange. But actually, I, I would say every editor that I've worked with is, is equally the same. John Witherow was, was, was great at the Times, Sunday right. Times. Um, so I, you know, I think, I think edit, most editors of national newspapers know what the relationship with the lawyer is. I mean, you know, in addition to me, I've got a small team of three in-house. There are three in-house lawyers at The Guardian. Uh, we, in addition to that, we have someone who comes in daily to do as much internet <coughs> publication as we can, and we have night lawyers who still come in at four o'clock every day to read the print copy. So you know, we try really hard to read as much as we can, and the, everything that's in the newspaper is still read by a lawyer. Uh, on the internet, we have a referral system so that we're only, we, we only read what we're asked to read, because we just can't possibly read everything. Um, and you know, we try, we try really hard not to get things wrong, but there are some issues where you know, Lance Armstrong at the Sunday Times what was, was, was a story where the Sunday Times felt that they should write that story. Um, there was a lot of legal input into it. You know, and, and you know, there are issues around that, that the lawyer in that case, um, you, know, it, you could see that a lawyer had been involved in that story. And is that right or wrong? Does, does that make your defense worse? because the lawyer has tried very hard to make the story safe. I mean, you know, it shouldn't do, I think, but it got, you know, got picked apart by the court who go paragraph by paragraph through it and say, well, you know, why has it got that in? Oh, that's because the lawyer or the newspaper are trying to avoid this. But you know, that, that's what your job is. So it, it's, it's a hard call sometimes. And you work together. You, know, you work together with the editor. But how about all those journalists and editors where they don't have, you said a small team of, um, no, it is small, reading the whole Guardian of Britain. But um, having worked in a couple of papers here and many of us in the room, I'm sure the same situation. We could only dream of having a team of three lot. Like it would be a good thing or bad thing, but certainly you, you, most papers out here would not have any in house lives at all. I mean, I guess it depends, you know, it, when you come from the UK where we've had very restrictive libel laws for, for, for a long time, that's what we do. If you, if you speak to US lawyers, they don't have, they don't do a lot of free pub lawyering. They do some, but they don't have the sort of setup that, that we have. Um, you know, when, we, when The Guardian set up its Australia website, um, I only got told about it quite late on, and I said to them, well, what are you doing about lawyering it? And they said, oh, well, we thought it'd be like America. And I said, <laughs> Peter will like this if he's still here. I said, Sydney's the libel capital of the world. You know, it's going to be even worse than London. So, you know, we've, we've got a team of lawyers now doing the pre-pub job in Australia, but we don't do the same in America because we don't feel a need to do it. Uh, Ying, Ying Chan, can we have a microphone at the front, please? Last week, the head of M15 said that um, accused the Guardian of uh, giving it the largest gift to terrorism and that he published a guidebook to terrorists. Right. Now, so in your considerations, when you look at the articles, when you, when you consider the Snowden case, how does this issue of terrorism, national security figure in your consideration, well, if at all? I mean, I think it's fair to say, as I said, you know, these days you have a whole gamut of things that you need to be aware of, which you know, I didn't need to be aware of 20 years ago. Uh, and nowadays, Section 57, 58 of the 2000 Terrorism Act is something that, that we are aware of because we've always been aware that it has the potential to affect journalists. So, I mean, but Schedule 7, had I ever heard of Schedule 7 of the Terrorism Act? No, I hadn't. I was, I was camping in a tent on the Sunday morning when David Miranda was detained. I get a phone call, I, in fact I get up and look at my Blackberry and find I've had about 16 phone calls and a number of emails. And I'm going, what on earth is Schedule 7? You know, I've never heard of it. Um, so, you know, we still have to try and ca catch up. But, you know, at the end of the day, all those things are about, I think, about responsibility, which is what we did, which is, again, coming back to the very first point of the globalization. In, in America, 
both with WikiLeaks on the cables and with the Edward Snowden stuff, they have a dialogue with the White House or the Defense Department, um, free publication about how they do things. There has never been any suggestion from the American side, as far as I'm aware, that they should return the material or destroy it. That, that's just not been a, 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 a discussion at all. Um, what they do is have a dialogue. We're, we're thinking of publishing a story about this. Would you have any concerns? What are they? OK, we don't want to go there. Um, and what we've tried to do is sort of import that responsible approach into the UK. But the UK comes at a price because of prior restraint. So you, you're, you're more wary in the UK about doing those things. Um, and, and so that's the sort of, you know, to, set, to call it a game um, it, it demeans it, but that's the sort of process that you go through, uh, and we've tried to go through with, with the Snowden material. Simon. Jill, um, there's probably, a, there's a lot of students in the audience, and some of them may be thinking about a possible career as a media lawyer. So any, any advice there? Is there a future for uh, <laughs> media lawyers anywhere yeah. in the world? I'm sure there is. But as I say, I think you, know, you, you, you have to, well, I mean, I came from, I did my articles in the city. I did civil litigation. Uh, I was doing civil litigation in a city firm, doing banking litigation. And I thought, my god, how dull and boring is this? <laughs> it's all about money and full stops and commas. And, uh, and then I saw a job as a litigator for the BBC. Um, and, and so I went to the BBC as a litigator, not as a media lawyer. I'd done no libel at all. Uh, so, and now it is, you know, it, it's, it's, it's got, it is a jurisprudence all in its own right. It, you know, Article 10, Article 19, uh, it, there, there are equivalents in, in, in other places that form these fundamental things. And um, so, you know, it, it is going to, of course it's going to continue. But I think you also have to remember that, you know, journal, commercial news organizations and, and broadcasters, you know, we're, we're in a privileged position. We, are, we, we have taken upon ourselves, to some extent, uh, the mantle of trying to protect free speech. But Article 10 and Article 19 are about free speech for everybody. They're, it's an individual right. And actually, the wording of those, both, all those things doesn't mention journalism at all. So you know, it, it's about protecting civil liberties in the same way. Now, you know, there are conflicts with that. It comes into conflict with Article 8 and, and, and others, occasionally Article 3, 2, whichever one's the, you know, Death, one. Um, <laughs> if you're suggesting media law is a jurisprudence in its own right, then can you offer hope yeah. to um, <laughs> that uh, you don't have to go through the drudgery of commercial work first? Do you, do you, you might be possible to go straight in. I mean, if you, law I mean, if you want career advice, I, I think what I would say is, you know, you, it's it's still quite a small world, and uh, you know, don't think that you can just walk into the door and be a media lawyer. I think there are lots and lots of different routes into it. By, by, by a variety of ways. And um, I, I think that you have to you know, be prepared to go in and work in a firm that, that maybe does some media law, or you go you know, to an organization that doesn't necessarily do that sort of law, and you work your way around it. But you know, the skill base is still essentially, uh, I think, a litigation one for us as an in-house lawyer, because I, I, I have always thought that it's very hard to see the problems of um, getting something, your judgment, your risk <coughs> assessment wrong, and then being sued or having um, a PCC complaint if you, ha you haven't done both sides of the coin. You know, it's, it's too easy to say, well, I, you know, I thought this was all right. I didn't realize there was going to be an endless argument over meaning, which is you know, what we had with the, I've referred to the Lance Armstrong case a few times, but it still comes back to haunt me. Because um, you know, the fact is, he, well, the Sunday Times were right. Uh, but the libel law uh, in England at that time, the way it was constructed, and to some extent the way it is still constructed, on the, the over-analysis we do on meanings, so we have these levels of meaning. The court decided in Armstrong that the article meant he was guilty, and we never had the evidence to, su to suggest guilt. We had circumstantial evidence that went quite a long way. Um, and once that decision was made on meaning, essentially, it, we were sunk, but you know, it, it also personified for me the problems around burden of proof. You know, when we started off that litigation, when he started suing us, and we, we, we got as far as the first bit of disclosure, 
And the only disclosure that he gave was about 100 articles that have been about him in the UK press. He gave not another single jot, and yet you knew that you know, a lot of the answers to this were within him. I mean, he couldn't even produce his BlackBerry on which he'd had his Reynolds exchange. And the chances were we weren't going to be able to get that because of the burden of proof. Um, you know, and that's a very frustrating thing, and that is still, that is still I think, going to be a problem, even with the new, uh, the new Defamation Act. That, that, that fundamental issue about how you go. Now, you, Reynolds, you know, there were problems with Reynolds on Armstrong because David Walsh, who wrote the article in the Sunday Times, had approached Armstrong not as a Sunday Times writer, but as the author of a book that was coming out. And there was a big argument about whether he would, the Sunday Times could rely on David's approaches as the book author. Uh, you know, it gets complicated. And, and, and claimants come up with all sorts of uh, potential challenges that undermine what you think looked like a very good defense when you started. Um, and that's the reality of it. If you can manage one more question, we'll go to, um, last question goes to Lord Hunt. Oh, Jill. Um, but is, was that an answer or another question? Um, isn't the skill set changing? Are we now talking much more about alternative dispute resolution rather than litigation? And one of the lessons I've certainly learned from the Leveson Inquiry is that we do have a bit of work to do to restore public trust and confidence in the press. Now, there are two things I just wanted to ask you. First of all, I think The Guardian has led the way in dealing with complaints direct. One of the provisions of the model, which Leveson accepted, was that the regulator should deal with complaints as a last resort. The editor and the paper should be the first. Now, at the moment, the PCC you mentioned the words PCC complaint. At the moment, a lot of complaints are channeled through the PCC. Do you think that newspapers and magazines have the skill set at the moment to deal with complaints direct properly in the way that, say, the independent um, readers, editors do? And secondly, um, the model requires a standards arm which will require each newspaper magazine to have a compliance structure, which could be a Jill Phillips, who makes sure that the editor's code is, is understood by everyone and everyone subscribes to it. And again, Le Leveson said, what a, this proposal strikes me as eminently sensible. It's right that the primary responsibility for compliance lies with the company and they should be asked to take that responsibility seriously. Do you think that is a, a realistic prospect? I, I mean, I, I think that a lot of national newspapers are already doing that, in effect, making them, giving, giving people the opportunity to complain to them first before they go to the PCC. But I think, you know, we're, you know, I mean, we are reasonably well resourced. Uh, the, the difficulty is for the small local papers, the regions, the magazines, you know, how, how can they deal with complaints? Um, who's going to fund someone to do that for them? Uh, where are they going to get the skills to be able to do that? So I think there's, you know, I think there's, there's, there's a practical problem for them. I mean, the, the, the Guardian would very much wish to have the opportunity to resolve a complaint first internally before it goes anywhere else. And we try to encourage people to come to us, whether it's a, an editorial code complaint or a, or a legal complaint, to come to us first so that we can have a go at trying to resolve it. Um, if, if that doesn't work, then depending on what, what the complaint's about, it, it, it either goes at the moment to the PCC um, or uh, we, you know, we, we will end up being sued unless we can divert it down a sort of arbitration mediation route voluntarily. Compliance, I mean, you know, I hate, I, I'm, I'm a lawyer, I hate, you know, compliance, ugh. Um, You're not the only one. It's, um, you know, fills me with horror. And also, the trouble is, I, you know, I, I also do um, some employment law, and I sit as an employment law judge, and um, you know, I, I worry that what you end up with compliance, if you're not careful, is you, procedures are just done as tick boxes, and it doesn't solve the problem. And I think you've got to be very careful about 
um, what you mean by compliance and, and how you're going to assess it. Um, you know, if, if you're saying to me that every time The Guardian makes a decision on whether to do some undercover report or re recording, for example, we've got to have an audit trail that can be followed, uh, I, I'm just going to say to you that's not practical. If you're going to say to me that every time you use a confidential source, you've got to log it through a process, that is not going to be practical. Um, and I think you know, there are very real issues around here because if you start creating too much paper, that paper becomes dis disclosable. So if we're sued for libel, that may all become disclosed. So there's a lot of just practical issues that we've got to work through. I mean, if, if you're talking about compliance in terms of, you know, are, are we doing what we're supposed to do in terms of running a responsible news organization, then I, I don't have a problem with that at all. But you know, I think to some extent you test that by the number of complaints you get. Um, by the number of adverse adjudications that you get, and um, by what your readers generally think about you. Um, and I, I sort of think it comes back to the, the Hong Kong Press Council, which is, you know, it, it sort of works, and um, it, you can't always define what it is that, that, that makes it work, but don't just think that having compliance is, is an answer to that, because I, I don't think it is. You know, I don't know that compliance would have solved the phone hacking uh, at the News of the World, you know, I, I, because you can get round it. When there's a procedure, once you know what a procedure is, it's very easy to, 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 to subvert it. So I think you've got to be careful about that. Thank you very much. If it, I think compliance aside, if there's one theme that came through your, your fascinating answers over the past hour, it's uh, very much in keeping with the theme of this conference, isn't it? You're saying that the internet really has changed every aspect of media law, particularly struck by your suggestion that even the word journalist is, out, is coming out of date, isn't it? I don't know if anyone's got any suggestions for a substitute. Um, okay, um, I'm sure we're all very grateful to Jill Phillips for taking the time out. Thank you very much.